Good evening. And welcome to the Museum of Fine Arts Houston. I'm Caroline Gazer. I'm chair of learning and interpretation here and thrilled uh, to see all of you this evening. Uh, and we're thrilled to welcome Dr. David Driscoll and Dr. Curly Holton to the stage this evening and to co-host this event with the University Museum at Texas Southern University and specifically with Dr. Alvia Wardlaw, director of the University Museum at TSU and a member of the Board of Trustees of the Museum of Fine Arts Houston. The MFAH and the University Museum at TSU have a longstanding partnership this past summer, we co-organized and co-hosted the 20th Citywide African American Artists Exhibition, a wonderful tradition that we've held. Uh, we have had many TSU students participate in the annual Mellon Foundation Undergraduate Summer Academy here at the museum, introducing students to curatorial and other fields within museums. And we're looking forward to collaborating with the Alliance for HBCU Museums and Galleries, Harvard University, Wellesley College, and TSU on a 2020 summer undergraduate workshop on art conservation, which will focus on the Hannah Hall murals at TSU. So thank you to Dr. Wardlaw, Dr. Sarah Trotti, and all of our TSU colleagues for your partnership. Many, many thanks. And it gives me great pleasure now to introduce my colleague and friend, Dr. Alvia Wardlaw. Good evening, everyone. And welcome to the Museum of Fine Arts Houston. I have remarks that I'm going to give um, in a moment, but I just heard some news that I want to share with those of you um, who are here. I just learned of the passing of Carol Parrott Blue, who was an activist for the arts in this city, and her reach was beyond this country. Carol was someone who made us all better, and she was a gift to this city, her home. And she was in the midst of working on a project, on working on the 1619 project. And the last time I spoke with her, she was encouraging me to come and participate. Chiding was more like it, because that was Carol. She was always pushing herself more than she would push others. But it is a great loss. And as we celebrate the arts um, this evening, I would feel remiss if I did not pay respect to Carol um, and what she has done for the arts community throughout this country. Thank you. So welcome to an amazing, an amazing evening and a celebration of someone who is extraordinarily special. To say that David C. Driscoll is a pioneer in the field of African American art is to paint the narrative of his immense accomplishments with a very, very broad brush. Dr. Driscoll has done what very few artists have been able to achieve. He has become an accomplished and celebrated artist whose works are in major museums and private collections. An educator not only to legions of his students, but also to a global public. And a curator whose groundbreaking work in organizing the first major exhibition, the first major exhibition on African American art, two centuries of black American art changed forever the art world and its conversation and actions regarding the significance of African American culture. I first met Professor Driscoll in Dallas when his exhibition, Two Centuries, came to the Dallas Museum of Art. There, for the first time, I was able to see the work of African Americans in its vast and rich totality, from Fanner Baskets to the works of Alma Thomas. The genius of those images stayed with me. As a PhD student working on my dissertation on John Biggers at the University of Texas at Austin, 
I asked David Driscoll to serve on my dissertation committee. I had a strong committee, but I knew that I needed someone on that committee who could relate immediately to the narrative of the early life of John Biggers and who could guide me in placing this life within the important context of African American culture in the 20th century, especially with regards to the artist's role as an HBCU educator and his subsequent travels to Africa. David was the most generous of mentors and advisors and guided me quickly to other resources for my research and cautioned me about keeping a balance between the poetry and the basic and fundamental facts of my prose. I keep that advice with me to this day. And to this day, I treasure my friendship with David C. Driscoll. Even in the most iconic position that he now fills in the art world, David Driscoll continues to be the most giving of mentors and continues to be an inspiration to me as I strive to serve as an effective mentor to my students. We appreciate, David, your wealth of knowledge and your generosity of spirit, and we welcome you back to Houston. It's now my pleasure to introduce Araneta Pierce, who will be giving a brief reflection on her friendship with David Driscoll. As I lead into my remarks, I would like to say that as we celebrate David Driscoll this evening, it is evident of his work as you look at major scholars around the country, one of which we have in this room, in this city, in our hearts, and that would be the lady you just heard from, Alvia Wardlaw, who means so much to the arts in Texas. I'm greatly honored to be able to make a few comments about David Driscoll. There comes a time when the life and the work of a single American scholar has been so powerful and so impactful on an area of study that it must be acknowledged, celebrated, and documented. Such are the accomplishments of the Dean of African American Art, Professor David Driscoll. It would be folly to overlook the important African American historians, foundations, artists, and professors of African American art who preceded David Driscoll. But timing is everything, and the time was right for David Driscoll and the arts. Rarely, very rarely, in a person's lifetime does one have the chance to advance the course of history. Rarely does the power of a person's scholarship and the impact of one's curatorial skillfulness pivot the erudition, the visibility, and the appreciation of a major discipline, as has the scholarly work of David Driscoll. Additionally, the professor has created legions of disciples by influencing the career choices and the art appreciation of so many students from Talladega University to Fisk University and the University of Maryland College Park. Not to mention the numbers of African American art collectors he has inspired. As a past commissioner with the Texas Commission on the Arts, I can attest to the impact of two exhibitions that changed the arts in the state of Texas because of David Driscoll. First, in 1976, David Driscoll's landmark exhibition that Alvia alluded to, Two Centuries of Black American Art, originated at the Los Angeles County Museum and traveled to Dallas, to the Dallas Museum of Art, where it became the first major survey exhibition of African American art to appear in an established Texas museum. This exhibit received greater visibility and validation from the mainstream art world than any other group exhibition of work by black artists. Visitors travel statewide and nationwide to see it, and for years the catalog for the exhibition was the most relevant contemporary textbook on African-American art. 
In December of 1987, my husband Joe and I led the, I hope you got in, led the uh, charge to mount our friend David's second survey exhibit in our hometown at the San Antonio Museum of Art. The exhibit was entitled Hidden Heritage. David and his wife, sweet friend, Thelma, came to San Antonio for the opening and David presented a lecture at the San Antonio Museum. It was likewise a first in several categories for a San Antonio Museum. As a result of that exhibition, several San Antonio families became collectors, patrons, advocates, and board members of the museum. More importantly, school children who were sent from their schools every day to the museum by choice, not by, by bus, not by choice, had never before seen any art in this museum that had been created by African American artists or that included the images of African Americans. Imagine that. When I was preparing a presentation for a link conference in 1996, I called David for a quote. He said to tell them that art is not a luxury. It is vitally at the core of life. I've repeated that many times. There is so much I could say about this distinguished pioneer, but to si for, suffice it to say that for those of us around the country and certainly in Houston who advocate for the art of African Americans, Pro Professor David Driscoll has been and still is the North Star. Thank you. Thank you, Araneta, for those beautiful remarks. I have to say, I still have my catalog of two centuries. It's dog-eared and marked up, David, but um, it's with me all the time. So here to present to you the, the life and legacy of Professor Driscoll, I'd like to invite to the podium Dr. Curly Holton, who is director of the David C. Driscoll Center at the University of Maryland College Park. First, I'd like to thank the museum for extending this opportunity to share David's story with you, and the individuals that have helped make this possible in Houston, Alvia Warloa, as mentioned earlier, Miriam and Charlene Tumbler, who've been great supporters of this event. We're having a number of uh, activities during the week that I'm going to be here. David has to leave a little earlier. But I wanted to give you a little background on the Legacy Tour. But first, let me tell you a little bit about the David C. Driscoll Center, the center that was named in the honor of David C. Driscoll. Often it gets mistaken with the Driscoll Prize at the High Museum in Atlanta. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but there's a prize that's given out each year to an artist or an art historian. It is the largest. Uh, prize that is given to an African American uh, to date, and that's the David C. Driscoll Prize. But the Driscoll Center was established at the University of Maryland uh, near the time he was preparing to retire. The president of the University of Maryland and a committee of scholars thought if they created a center, it would keep David from retiring. <laughs> it didn't work. But, uh, <laughs> but they supported the creation of the center. They wanted a, a location that allowed the students to experience David's legacy. They were well aware of his major achievements as a scholar. He's the first African American chairman of the art department at uh, University of Maryland. So many firsts in his life and as uh, has been spoken by the previous uh, presenters and announcers that uh, David's legacy has been broad, deep, and rich. So my, uh, my daughter is a writer as well and she did a small piece with David some years ago, and she asked a question. Why David Driscoll? Why you? So I'm going to try to answer that question tonight for you. I think it's very important because he's a singular figure. I often refer to him in two different ways. I call him the super duper maestro, and I'll explain that a little later. That's the name he got while showing his work in Mexico, uh, in Oaxaca, Mexico. But I've described him as the Martin Luther King of African American art. It makes him itch a little bit when I say it. <laughs> But it's true. 
He's one of the few individu individuals that you will meet that not only transformed a discipline and established a canon, the position of that body of work was based on a very simple principle, that his legacy, his family, and his reality was valid. And there was no need to apologize for it, but to celebrate it. He had a father that was an undereducated minister. His mother was undereducated, and David decided he was going to college. I don't know where he got that idea from, but he said he was going to college. And I'm not going to get into that story too much. I don't want the introduction to be too long, but I'll draw this out of David as we talk. But he did arrive at Howard University to attend college, and he arrived on campus and walked into the building and went into a classroom and sat down. After a few visits, they informed him that he had to enroll as a student. He couldn't just show up at college, but David was going to college. So after a while, they arranged for him to enroll, and David became the star student. Uh, he had teachers like uh, James Leslie Wells, Elaine Locke, James Porter, Lois Melu Jones, and they gave birth to a individual that is a singular individual who's carried that legacy through 60, 70 years of work. And he's now celebrating his 88th birthday. And his 90th will be celebrated with a retrospective organized by the High Museum that would travel to the Phillips Collection, Portland Museum, Perez Museum in Miami to celebrate the story of David Driscoll. So my goal has been to bring that story closer to you. I did an informal talk with David in Allentown Art Museum, and they asked him to come and do a lecture because he was doing work in my studio. I'm, I'm a printmaker by training, and David's dedicated master printmaker, and uh, they asked us to come and do a talk at the museum, and David said, well, I don't want to do a formal lecture. I'm not prepared to do that. Why don't you just ask me some questions, and I'll talk. So the response was overwhelming. They had heard about David through his reputation, but to sit and listen to him talk was really quite amazing. Uh, soon after, I was at a dinner with Larry and Brenda Thompson, who are uh, just major patrons in support of the arts, and we were talking about this experience at Allentown. And I thought I'd give them a demonstration. I did, decided to provoke David into discussing early days at Howard with the competition between Lois Mingley Jones and James Porter. And the uh, couple that was hosting us, Larry and Brenda, was so taken by it as we were leaving to get our coats, Larry mentioned to me, he said, if you would be willing to take this on the road and share the story around the country, I would write the check for it, which he did. So we provide these talks around, this is our sixth um, talk, around the country. We charge no fees to do the talk. Sometimes institutions offer uh, honorariums and expenses, but this was funded by a patron to share the story around the country. So without any other delay, I'm gonna begin that story with Dr. Driscoll. Pleasure of being introduced to Dr. Driscoll in um, 2003 at uh, Lafayette College. I was uh, a professor who established the Experimental Printmaking Institute and later became uh, an endowed professor. Uh, that was historic because there were only three endowed professors in fine arts in the country at that time. And I think it's always disturbed David. He's a distinguished professor, but he said, I've never got an endowed chair, girl. <laughs> So he, he was introduced to us by a patron and uh, a trustee member, O'Reilly Temple, and we brought him to the campus, and we began to work on a project. We created a series of prints that became a part of the Master Artist Portfolio that's in the National Gallery collection. But I was so nervous about meeting him and working with him because I had only heard about his reputation. 
is larger than life reputation. But his demeanor and his comfort with people betrayed that notion that I had in my mind, that he was at a distance and untouchable. He was not that way. He was very relaxed, very welcoming. I had a student that was working with him and told him that he was from Maine, and David explained that he had lived in Falmouth, Maine, for many years since being a student at Skowhegan. And that's a story we'll tell you also. But I thought what I wanted to do was to create a, night, a beautiful print with him, and it turned into 16 years of editions, over 50 editions, travel around the world, and we'll tell you about some of those stories also. But in this slide here, this is his first international exhibition, solo show. Now, he's organized exhibitions. This was at, um, in Oaxaca, Oaxaca, Mexico. And during that show, they have a tradition in Mexico where they have a lot of fanfare. They have fireworks, they have dignitaries come in to speak. An artist stands outside, and there's a red ribbon normally in the doorway, and no one can go into the gallery, and the crowd's built outside. The dignitaries say special words in honor of their guests. And then David is to join the mayor of uh, Oaxaca and cut the ribbon. But while the talking is going on, David has slipped under the ribbon, going into the gallery to have conversations with the servers who are putting out the wine and the food. He's snacking a little bit, drinking. I had to run in there and grab him and pull him out. I said, David, that's not the way they do it in Mexico. So they cut the ribbon, fireworks, it was a phenomenal exhibition. Later that night, one of the ways in which they demonstrate regard for a teacher or an artist is they greet them as maestro. And we would be walking down the street and they, someone would walk up and say, good morning, maestro. Well, the artists that were called maestros decided that David was so significant they had to give him a special title and they called him super duper maestro. <laughs> I still, he's in my phone, SDM is when I get ready to call. So anyway, to let you know that, uh, and to go back to this comment I made about why David Driscoll, is I want to bring you closer to this story and closer to this living legacy. Because it's a rare opportunity to really sit with someone of his stature and experience, especially as an artist. Normally we meet artists at exhibitions, they give a talk, a reception. But to sit down and to go around the country telling this story, he's not only telling his story, he's telling our story. And that's what's precious about it. And this is another exhibition uh, uh, event that we had in uh, Athens, Greece, to your left. This is interesting. I'm going to come back to this a little later. But he mentioned to me and Dorit, Dorit is my colleague, the Deputy Director of the Driscoll Center, who arranges all these events for us that he had two students in Athens that were his students at Howard University in 1968, 64. And he remembered their names. And Dorit tracked them down. We were doing a conference in Athens, and I was presenting work about the collaboration with Dr. Driscoll, and Dorit was doing a presentation on the Driscoll Center. And David was in Spinocchio, Italy, on one of his vacations, lecturing on his vacation. <laughs> that means it's a, vac a paid vacation. That's what that means. So we invited David over, and he arrived, and the two students, he was able to find the two students, and they met him at the door, and they just hugged and kissed him and came to tears. Their teacher, after what, 40 years almost, 44 years, it was amazing to witness. And there are other stories I'll tell you as we go through the, the talk. But again, it's about this legacy, a living legacy, the celebration of his life while we have him with us. And that's a rare uh, opportunity and a rare event for you to have someone in your company to be in your life like this. It's very important. So I'll show you a few more slides and then I'll start uh, a conversation with David. This is at Skowhegan. Now, the reason we went to Skowhegan is uh, to your left, you see a slide at a dinner at uh, the Plaza Hotel in New York City. David was receiving a war, and this was the most amazing event that I witnessed. 
David was not only the keeper of the legacy of our cultural and creative practice, he was a living memory of Skowhegan. He was the oldest living former student of Skowhegan. This was not an African-American institution. He was one of the first African-American students to go to Skowhegan in 1950, 53, with another student. The first time African-American students were invited to Skowhegan. And here he is the governor of Skowhegan. So it's not only our institutions and our legacy, but it is America's legacy. He is a national treasure. So we visit to Skowhegan any time I visit him in Falmouth, Maine. And uh, this is a shot of me and an, an artist from Mexico City visiting. And here's David uh, on your left slide signing a new edition at his private home in um, Falmouth, Maine. He lives in a 20-acre woodland area with a studio. Not 20, 12. No twos in there? How many? Just eight. Eight acres. Just eight. <laughs> It's so wooded, it's, he says, that, oh, I own as far as you can see, Curly, and that's eight for him. <laughs> but anyway, we would go up each summer and we'd do additions and work with him there, and they love him in Maine. And uh, he told me the story of going to Skowhegan and why he lived in Maine, and I'm going to let him tell you this. So tell us why Maine, why Portland, why Skowhegan? Well, first of all, thank you, Houston for inviting me back to this wonderful city. Um, Dr. Wardlow has been trying to plan an event which allowed me to come back here for a number of years and in between there were other places and events that kind of prohibited that so I'm very grateful to her and to you here at the museum and so many other places for inviting me back and I want to express my sympathy for Dr. Carol Parrott Blue. Just talked with her about a month ago. We were considering uh, working on a joint project, actually, with the well-known cinematographer Sam Pollard. HBO. As a matter of fact, he's coming next week to film me in Maryland. So I am deeply saddened to learn of her passing. God rest her soul in peace. <clears throat> Skowhegan, I got there in 1953 uh, by kind of a strange coincidence because I was a student at Howard University. I was a junior, and Howard University had never sent an undergraduate mm. to Skowhegan prior to that time. Um, they had, I remember a graduate student who came to Texas to teach at Prairie View A&M University. At that time, her name was Pearl Sewell. She had gone to Skowhegan, and it was this great banner of respect mm. as a Howard graduate student and I wanted to follow in her footsteps but there was some consideration that I was an undergraduate. And so the faculty finally decided, well, I think he's mature enough to go. And so they sent me and I made progress that summer. As a matter of fact, I won the Bocour Art Progress Prize, which was a prestigious prize that connected me to the famous paint manufacturer, Leonard Bocour. And we became good friends and remained so over the years. But Skowhegan <clears throat> connected me to the art world in a way that I never would have had the chance to be so involved had I not been uh, chosen to go there. And it became a, a celebrated place for me in many ways. I later became a member of the faculty, visiting uh, lecturer. Uh, joined the Board of Governors, uh, Board of Trustees, and later advisor. And as you mentioned in 2016, they, they give awards every year that are coveted throughout the world, actually. But they did um, 
create a special award, which they said they would probably never give again in my honor, the Lifetime Legacy Award. And so I'm indebted to institutions like that, which cross the color line, because I think too often we forget that we live in a country where, yes, there's contradiction, there's racism, uh, the uh, spoils of Jim Crow and segregation, but we are a nation of good people. And we will remain a nation of good people regardless of who says they are leading us. And so I think we have to keep those kinds of, of uh, ideals in mind. And I have been fortunate to be counted amongst those who really feel that the African American contribution is a major contribution to the visual arts in America. And I have spent my 88 and a half years trying to reiterate the importance and to restate the importance of the contributions that African Americans have made to the visual arts in America and to minorities in general. Because, you know, look at it, women are still minorities in the arts even though they are, have the highest enrollment mm, in art schools in sure. the country, they are still looked upon as minorities. Um, George O'Keefe, whom I got to know when I was a um, professor at Fisk University, and she had given the Alfred Stieglitz collection, graduate of Fisk, <laughs> to uh, Fisk University in 1949. And in a conversation with her, she said to me, I was, in 1968, we were, I was meeting her at the Stanhope, Stanhope Hotel there in the Metropolitan, across the street from the Metropolitan Museum in New York. And I was talking about the art scene, the African American art scene, and, you know, she could be, caustic, she could be kind and generous, but she could also come to the point of things. Mm -hmm. So she looked at me after I'd finished my little dialogue <clears throat> of saying African-American artists being left out and so forth and so on. And she said, what are you complaining about? You are a male. And men run the art world in this country. And she shocked me by saying, women are the, and she used the N word, of the art world, not you. It really kind of shook me up, you know. <laughs> Um, Tell us how you got to, how you got to her apartment. How did that come about that you were meeting her? Well, I was um, chairman of the art department and director of the gallery at Fisk University. This was in the, <clears throat> around 1968, and I noted that the works in the Stieglitz collection, 101 works, major works by European and American masters, nothing like it in the South. Blue period because I walk in my office every day and look at a blue period Picasso that they found. I would look at Renoir's. I would look at Cezanne's, Marston Hartley's, mm. Charles Sheila. You couldn't go to any major museum in the South and see that kind of thing. We didn't have security. Nobody thought about taking them. But she had planted those works there, and I said to her, I said, the works are in disrepair in some regards. They haven't been conserved. And this is 1968, and she planted them there in 1949. And I said, we need money to conserve these works. And I'd like to do a benefit at the Wilderson Gallery in New York 
to make sure that we raise money and do this. And she said, Stiegler's never felt that the works improved with travel. So that was kind of like the end of that. So the work was not to travel. The work was not to travel. So I said, well, now, I'm supposed to be smart enough to get around that. <laughs> and I went back to the notion that we needed conservation. And I said, you know, these works are in disrepair in some regards. And uh, they can't continue to be hung on the wall without conservation, et cetera. And uh, I said, but Ms. O'Keefe, you know, you were ahead of your time. You still are. Feminist. I named all those wonderful categories. <clears throat> and I said, but to give 101 works to a little black school in Tennessee in 1949. I said, what did you expect would happen to them? Because you didn't endow them. And she looked at me and she said, you've got guts. She said, but I like you. Now, what do you want from me? And I had my speech all in my head, and I said, I need $50,000 immediately, and I'll go to John Spencer, director of the National Endowment for the Arts. He will match it with discretionary funds, and we'll get the work conserved. And she turned to her assistant, Miss Doris Bree, who had already made a statement as I came in and admired her brooch. You know, she wore that brooch and said, okay. And luckily, I knew who made that brooch, she, it, it was made by uh, Alexander Calder. She called him Sandy. And she said, oh, Sandy made this for me. She said, oh, you like it? She said, maybe I'll give it to you someday. And Miss Bree stood six feet two and said, Miss O'Keefe, we're giving away nothing today. <laughs> so there I was, now how am I gonna get beyond that? I'm supposed to be smart enough and intelligent enough to not react emotionally, mm -hmm. but find out how do we get above and beyond that. So Dr. Pierce, I said, you were ahead of your time, et cetera, et cetera. And she said, Doris, Ms. Bree, I want, she'd forgot my name, she said, I want Mr. Fisk to have a check tomorrow for $50,000. And Miss Bree was furious. I was happy. <laughs> Three days later, we had special delivery back then, you know. Check comes in the mail. I called up Dr. Spencer and I said, I have my 50000 Are you ready to? Match it, he said, I will match it immediately. And that was the beginning of the restoration of the works. Uh, Araneta, you know, the first restoration of those works at Fisk University. Well, that's a long drawn out story, but um, <clears throat> her last retrospective, major retrospective, which opened at the, at the um, Whitney Museum uh, in 1970. And she, um, had said to me the work, nothing could travel. But she then had Miss Bree, her assistant, um, call me and say they want to borrow Radiator City, you know, the iconic work by George O'Keefe that's in the Fisk collection. And uh, I said, well, have her put it in writing. And so I got the letter. And I'm, in the meantime, I'm building up my letter file, you know, because someday I might need to auction these letters off, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and um, why David Driscoll, right? <laughs> <laughs> so we uh, get the letter, and I respond. I say, my dear Mr. Keith, I must remind you of the stringency of your gift. Regrettably, the works can't travel. 
And that's when she said, I want to see you in New York tomorrow. <laughs> and that was a part of the plan. But before you got to Fish, you know, you had a, like, quite a nice experience at Howard as an undergraduate with James Port and others. And I think you told me for a while you worked, you drove a taxi to support yourself as a student. You were driving uh, Langston Hughes around and individuals like that to make extra mm -hmm. money. And then you leave Howard, and from Howard you go to Talladega? No, I went from Talladega to Howard. Talladega to Howard. And then okay. Howard back to Fisk. Okay, right. And at Fisk you were able to work with a lot of major artists. Major and artists. My understanding is some of these artists, this was their first positions at a university, like Martin Perrier, I think you Yeah, Martin Perrier, I hired him right out of graduate school. I had known Martin when he was an undergraduate at the Catholic University of America where he was an undergraduate and I was in graduate school. And we stayed in touch over the years when he joined the Peace Corps. And uh, when he wrote to say, I'm, I want to go to grad school, where do you recommend I go? And I said, either Yale or Cranbrook. And he chose Yale. When he graduated two years later, 1971, he wrote and he said, well, I'd like to teach someplace. And I just happened to have had an opening at Fisk and I invited him to come to Fisk. We, of course, renewed our friendship and have continued over the years. But you mentioned um, the artist who came. Aaron Douglas had just retired. I took his place at Fisk. And people said, you're leaving Howard University, the capstone, to go to Fisk. But they didn't know the rich history of the arts at Fisk. And Aaron had helped to cultivate it there. They knew about the music, the Jubilee Singers, and that great stride there. But they didn't know that much about the arts. But Fisk had marvelous collections. The Baldrige collection from the 1920s, where Cyrus Baldrige had gone to Africa and had been commissioned by the Rockefeller Foundation to do all of these wonderful portraits. No other portraits in the world like them, portraits of dignity of Africans in that collection. And then, of course, the Stieglitz collection comes in 1949, and later the Harmon Foundation collection comes in 1967. So there was this richness of arts at Fisk that Howard did not have, even with all of its it's wonderful array of collections. Well, you had artists that we can see here, like uh, Romir Bearden came, Jacob Bearden. Lawrence came, mm -hmm. you mentioned Aaron Douglas, Elizabeth Catlett. Elizabeth Catlett, Palmer Hayden, Richard Hunt, um, and some of the younger artists, Afra Cobra, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I took a chance on believing that we could not be so selective that we had to leave anybody out. Mm. And um, people would um, say, well, this, this isn't in the tradition of uh, black art, so on, so on, so Well, build the tradition. Sure. Break the rules. Make it work. And that was what I was able to do at Fisk. And I don't think I could have done it at any other place. But you were the only real uh, curator and writer at this time that was paying attention to African-American artists for the most part. And that if you didn't write about them, in some ways they didn't exist. Well, uh, I would say... And you were documenting them. I was documenting. There were other writers. Samela Lewis, um, you know, Regina Perry was coming on the scene. Uh, and there were a number of other younger African-American art historians who were beginning to put the literature out there to erase the paucity, which was out. The reason I mention it because I've heard a number of artists mention in the, 19, uh, the two centuries that cutoff date was 1950. 1950, yes. And for the ones that were 1951, they were a little upset. Well, <laughs> that the cutoff well date. and that, that was really a logistical problem of how are you going to include everybody? Mm -hmm. uh, you didn't have a museum large enough to make that uh, happen. I remember speaking with uh, Harry Parker, who was director of the Dallas Museum, when uh, we um, were arranging for the show to come there. And he said, well, we just don't have the space in our current exhibition space to include uh, X number of people beyond a certain, certain stage. We, we would have been happy to include Richard Hunt, Sam Gilliam, and artists like that 
And people would say, well, why don't you include them? Well, we had to have a mandate. And you have to listen to the museum. You can't be the curator, the director, uh, everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got categories. And um, the L.A. County Museum underwent some stringent criticism for doing that show, in-house and exterior. Mm -hmm. Two curators said, if you do that black show, we're going to resign. Now, let's talk about that a little bit. I, you told me before about first meeting and presenting the concept of the exhibition to the board at LACMA, and mm -hmm. some were against you doing this, and you did tell me one of the curators. But there was a, a primary patron on the well, board. Well, you know, in the large cities like uh, L.A. and Houston and Dallas and what have you, you have to be mindful of your patronage. You have to do things to help uh, them realize their interest and commitment. People don't, you know, most people just assume, well, why didn't you buy my work at the Museum of Fine Arts at Houston? Well, it doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. You've got to have support. Mm -hmm. Most of the works are bought through patronage. And one of the patrons from one of the big movie industries, Metro Golden Maya, um, and the woman was very factual, not at all discourteous, but she said to me, she said, Professor Driscoll, this was 1974, she said, I'm Jewish, and I would not want to present an exhibition of Jewish art to celebrate the American Bicentennial in 1976. Why would you want to present an African American exhibition? And uh, I had to control my temper. <laughs> and I said, well, Mrs. Golden, um, American jewelry has always been in the forefront of defining, of showcasing American culture. It's one of the great traits and characteristics of it. I said, I was sent to school by a Jewish family, partially. And I said, I learned a lot about the concept of justice mm. and understanding that I had not gotten in my own community. And I said, I know you know more about your culture than I do, but I am not presenting an exhibition for Jewish culture, for Caucasian culture, whatever you want to call it, not even just for black culture. I am presenting an exhibition for American culture so you will understand the broadness mm -hmm. of this concept. These artists that you've never heard of, just as good as any, but they've been left out because of their color. Look at the literature paucity of literature on these artists. That's why you need two centuries. And on that panel was Charles White, a dear friend, Aurelia Brooks, who had been a classmate of mine at Howard University in the 50s. Aurelia would always say, no, I wasn't there. I was younger than he was. <laughs> <laughs> but she was there. <laughs> she was there. She used to model for us in Lois Jones' class. And um, uh, many other people. And uh, it's, it's the notion that you're going to base it on uh, the idea that this is not the time. You can't wait for the time. Mm -hmm. The time is right. The time is now. And I say to, you know, I get a lot of color, uh, questions. I move around the country, young people and older people, and they ask about collecting. And I say, you can't wait. Now is the time. Mm -hmm. when you're, you can't wait until you're ready. When you're ready, you can't afford it. Buy now. Yeah, sure. And the words of Booker T. Washington, let down your buckets where you are. Mm -hmm. And 
there will, will be the wealth that you need. But so finally, to conclude this, Mrs. Golden became one of the major patrons of that exhibition. Mm -hmm. And uh, had I not been frank with her about it and said, oh, yes, I'm going back to the movie and buy another ticket, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that wouldn't have helped the situation. Sure. Be factual. Be frank about it. And above all, be truthful and just. And it'll take care of itself. You know, you, you t talk about putting an exhibition like this together, and we think about the impact it has had. Not only at that point in time, but later. It set the stage in many ways for the foundation of the canon. I remember we were visiting uh, Kerry James Marshall at the Astor Gates, and we walked into the studio, and the first thing Kerry James Marshall wanted was David to sign his two centuries book, mm -hmm. to pay homage to him. I've been around art historians who come up to him and say that it wouldn't have been possible had it not been for David Driscoll who opened that door. At one time at the University of Maryland, David had the largest number of PhD students under his advisory for the study of African American art in the country. So they were coming to the University of Maryland because David Driscoll was at the University of Maryland. So he became a distinguished teacher at the University of Maryland and uh, recognized by the president of uh, the medal. He had the University Medal for teaching at the University of Maryland. Thank you. Yeah, presidential medal. He taught classes in uh, understanding different medias, acoustic. One of the things about David that I, I, is so refreshing with me is he's classically trained. So we talk about pigment, we talk about composition, we talk about history. Uh, you, contemporary young artists don't always have that background or that conversation that they can have with you about the medium, about the history of practice. I would say names to some of them. They wouldn't even know. I mean, who's your God? I mean, uh, Hal Woodruff went to Europe and his first meeting with Henry O. Tanner was he asked, well, who was your God? You know, and Tanner was his God. And Tanner talked about his God. As, uh, these are artists that were their models and standards and inspirations. And uh, unfortunately, we see that kind of tradition ending. Uh, when I went to school, the first thing you did was told them who you studied with. I told them, I studied with Robert Blackburn in New York. I say Rob Blackburn, and they, they're just amazed. Now, young artists, they never tell you who they study with. It's like they're their own creation, their own invention. That legacy was so important, and I illustrate that as David's history had to do with capturing that legacy and saving that legacy for us. And the collectors are the same. They're the, they're the guardians of that history and that culture and that legacy. So I'm going to go back to Howard just a little bit. And you mentioned uh, uh, Brady, who was a part of the Harmon Foundation. The Harmon Foundation was sponsored by Mr. Harmon, who was a real estate uh, tycoon who decided to support the arts, and there was a special support of African-American artists, uh, Negro artists at that time, and Mary Brady was his uh, director. director, and she also uh, picked on David to be one of her uh, mentees and, and exposed to him a great deal of opportunities and sometimes made recommendations for him. But I read some letters in our archives. We have the archives of David Driscoll at the David C. Driscoll Center. Not only archives of his papers, but we have a large uh, archives of paintings. We do exhibitions, programming at the Driscoll Center. But in those archives, I like to go in and read them sometimes. And I, was, I read two, three letters by uh, Biggers, John Biggers, that were written that you have in the archives. And in 1962, he was writing to Mary Brady about the Harmon Foundation. And later on, and I think it was 63, he wrote a letter asking uh, could he find a way to purchase uh, John Henry's... The John Henry series by Palmer Hayden. Uh, Palmer Hayden. And so these dialogues, and David is a part of these dialogues, and those works are historic. But you get insight, and part of the reason the story is, is important that the story is told, that you have insights into how David Driscoll became David Driscoll and his friendships and relationships with artists like Elizabeth Catlett, uh, Lois Jones, the list just goes on and on. But that, can you talk about Mary Brady and the Harmon Foundation for just a little bit? 
and the impact that they were having on the canon? Well, as you say, the, the Harmon Foundation had as its special goal, after it experimented with religious filmmaking, it didn't go very well, um, they had two other projects. One was building playgrounds for black children in the South. We, very, we hear very little about that. Mm. Uh, kind of like what Julius Rosenwald did. He built did. the schools throughout the South. Yeah. Rosenwald built the schools, but Harmon Foundation. That was a co owner of Sears and Roebuck, right? Sears and Roebuck. Yeah. Was, uh, yes. Uh, and uh, of course, the Harmon Foundation didn't have the money that uh, Mr. Rosenwald had. But <clears throat> they shared it, but it was under the tutelage of Mary Beatty Brady, whose father had been a territorial governor of Alaska long before it became a state, and there were many political contradictions and things going on. They were very staunch conservative Republicans. But Miss Brady had this streak of charity in her of wanting to help what she called the Negro artists of the era. And so in 1926, she became director of the Harmon Foundation. They never had another director. And her goal was to reach out to all parts of the country, as far west as California, and try and coalesce, bring this thing together and say, yes, there is a movement. And she is not given credit for being one of the catalysts for the Harlem Renaissance because the artist felt that she interfered too much. And she did. But in some cases, it was good interference. Mm -hmm. uh, they would not have had the Harmon Prizes without her. And artists like uh, William H. Johnson. William H. Johnson. Would have received the Indeed, prize. received prizes. To Europe. Yes. And she was a hands-on person. What does that mean? It means that you paid due diligence to her. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and you recognized. You had to pay homage to her. You it. paid homage to her. <laughs> And uh, I came along at the tail end of all of that, and I was the very last person, artist, that she sponsored and sent to Europe mm -hmm. in 1964. And she had made all these arrangements and connections, and that's how I got connected to the Rockefeller Foundation and uh, many other entities that I would not have had a chance to be involved with had it not been for Mary B. Brady, Miss Mary B. Brady. And she would always say, don't call her Mrs. She'd say, I missed a lot by being Miss. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but she was very dedicated to what she was doing. And the, the thing that was kind of difficult for me was, with me, it was like, almost like a hands-on situation. When I went to Talladega, she kind of said, OK, this is the one. I'm going to send the works to mm. Talladega. She sent X number of works to Talladega in 1955, but you had to read the fine print in those letters. It said, during the incumbency of David C. Driscoll, mm. indefinite loan. So if you thought they were yours, think again. Mm -hmm. They were going if with David. They were going with David. <laughs> so when I left to go to Howard, uh, she decided that she wanted to send some of them to Howard. And I advised her. Howard had a large collection, you know. And I advised her. I said, no, no, no. I think you should consider other places. And she waited. I was at Howard for four years. In 1966, I left to go to Fisk. And she had good race relations with Aaron Douglas. And that was where she said, OK, this is it. So she said, over oh, 400 works wow. to Fisk University. Including the Two Soap Literature series by mm. Jacob Lawrence. Mm -hmm. She also sent that series, the John Henry series, mm. by Palmer Hay, that um, uh, Professor Biggers was trying to acquire had entertained but... for Texas Southern. And it got mixed up in family relations and so forth, and was recalled by um, Miriam Hayden when Palmer died. So that kind of died down. But there were all those very important papers that 
were there mm -hmm. that really kind of... Did you have the Jean Toomey papers there, too? That was at Fisk. That was at Fisk. Okay. That was at Fisk. So but those papers were removed. Love letters from Georgia? Uh, I'm not going to go into that. Okay. <laughs> um, no, that's, 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 that's not to be talked about. Okay, we'll, we'll talk about uh, As uh, okay. my <laughs> friend said, some things you take, take it to the grave. <laughs> um, those <laughs> letters and everything else, um, you know, the second Mrs. Too Much sued Fisk and, and, and retrieved the letters. But I'll just simply say, yeah, they were there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. But at Fisk, you were, you were also not only teaching, you were practicing. Throughout your career, not just at Fisk, but Talladega, you were a practicing artist. And uh, it was interesting that for many of us as artists, we also had to take on the role as art historian. Because there were no art historians out there at our institutions where we studied. And sometimes you would have a student who was well informed about art history would teach African American art in the evenings mm -hmm. after school because there was no text, mm -hmm. no books. When I studied at the Cleveland Institute of Art, there was one slim catalog by Elizabeth Catlett. Now, Huey Lee Smith had studied there, but nothing on the shelf from Huey Lee Smith. Charles Sillet, that is in James Porter's book, nothing by Charles Sillet on it. On the, it's almost like you were inventing yourself. There were no models for you. And I can remember when uh, earlier Floyd talked about when David uh, first came to his undergraduate institution and it transformed. Memphis Institute of Art. The, Mes the Inst Institute of Memphis Institute of Art. Trans it was transformative. So in many ways, David was really leading that charge, and that was important. And recognized, as you see, by as distinguished university professor of art. On the slide to your right, the president of the university. And other slides give you a background of David Wall at uh, University of Maryland. His work that he's done with other artists, Mel Edwards, you see here, William T. Williams, and others. Uh, Lou Stovall. He's a group of artists as part of American Art and Identity that he put together conferences, panel discussions. So I want to get to David's work a little bit, his own personal practice. Oh, before I do that, we, maybe we'll look at this. This is a slide of President uh, Clinton uh, mm -hmm. giving David the National Humanities Medal in recognition of that service. Um, yeah, that was a stellar day. <laughs> uh, you still have the napkins from the White House? <laughs> no, I okay, didn't take I'm sorry. Any <laughs> um, December 16, 2000. And um, I felt honored to be in the company of some of the greats in the arts period. In my group that year was um, Maya Angelou. Mm -hmm. Uh, Barbara Streisand, mm -hmm. Zach Perlman, mm -hmm. uh, Chuck Close. Um, the writer just died recently from Louisiana, uh, African American writer. Ernest Gaines. Ernest Gaines. Ernest Gaines. Mm -hmm. Quincy Jones. Uh, you know, it was it was the a company. A good company. <laughs> and uh, Tony Morrison. Mm -hmm. So we felt very privileged just being in that kind of company there. And um, being uh, honored and received by the President of the United States. But uh, yeah, I think it's important to recognize that David wasn't only a scholar, but began his practice as a visual artist was recruited from the classroom by James Porter to say that you could do more than just make art, you can tell this story. And to the writer, some of the images uh, we'll go through to show you David's work. This is called Ghetto Wall, the Ghetto Wall in uh, Black Ghetto. So David was responding to his environment, the movement, uh, 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 social movements going on in the 60s and 70s. Although he was classically trained, he was still referring to these experiences. And you can see this in his work. I might just mention that, that, that you know, in those days, Howard is still a great institution. That's my alma mater, and I, I 
very critical of them for certain things. But I'd say, you, I can criticize them, but don't you, mm -hmm. don't you, because how it took me in, and they could have called security on me <laughs> when I insisted on sitting there and, and uh, writing home saying I'm in college, mm -hmm. you know. But, um, and then when I came back to teach, the glory of that era in the 1960s, 1962, I, now Howard's a black university, yes, but I disguised some of the content in my courses in 1962 because the curriculum committee, you know what that is, sometimes said, well, I don't know if we need that. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to teach this course, which included elements of black protest art, mm -hmm. aesthetics, etc., and my own interpretation of what art should be. And uh, I had to walk lightly. Mm -hmm. But word got around that there's this new young professor over there in the College of Fine Arts, which they're bringing back, thank heavens, to Howard, um, teaching this strange course. And um, in that course was an array of students, mm -hmm. Lou Stovall, mm -hmm. Sylvia Snowden, uh, Mary Lovelace at that time, sure. Mary Lovelace O'Neill, who later became chairman of the art department at Berkeley. And, you know, we knew everybody's business. She was dating, dating Stokely Carmichael. Who was in the class? Stokely was in the class. He told me later, he said, I didn't come in the class to learn. He was a philosophy major, brilliant. He said, every afternoon I'd go to pick up my lady and she talked about Mr. Driscoll, Mr. Driscoll. He said, I took that class to find out who is this Mr. Driscoll? <laughs> and of course, Stokely was one of the few who got an A in the class. <laughs> Mary didn't get an A. <laughs> um, but in that class was um, Walter Evans, mm -hmm. Jesse Norman. It was Stella. And Harold Wheeler, the composer. It was major. And um, I think back on those days at Howard, and uh, they were days of greatness. Mm -hmm. So it prepared you in prepared many ways. prepared me to. So as mentioned earlier in your introduction, <coughs> a moment of opportunity arrives, and you prepare for that opportunity. Mm -hmm. But let's talk a little bit more about your work, uh, the mixing of mediums. And I know you do a lot of collage work. You like to do work that was inspired by your environment. You want to talk about that a little bit? You see what we have up there? Well, I, uh, back in the 19, and I don't want to prolong this too long now because mm -hmm. I know you got other things to do. Um, I, um, I started doing a series of works um, called the Americana series, which included chairs. People said, painting chairs? I said, yeah, chairs have interesting history. Mm -hmm. You don't always know who sat in that chair. Think about who sat there and had great thoughts. Mm. May have informed the world in a certain way. So I, I did this series of chairs called the Americana series. And um, most of them have been collected by museums now. I gave a talk down at the National Museum of African American History and Culture. And somebody said to me, well, I'll never sit in another chair without thinking about <laughs> who sat there <laughs> after this. But um, when I was teaching at Talladega College in 1955, there was the murder of Emmett Till. Mm -hmm. And uh, it just took me by, you know, it, it just got me every place it could get me. And um, I had to respond to it some way. I had studied painting with Jack Levine, social commentary artist sure. up at yeah. Skowhegan, and had greatly admired his style, the Kairoscura Kairo style painting from dark to light and so forth. So I had to get this thing out of my system. So I painted this composition, Behold Thy Son, which goes back to the biblical reference when Christ is on the cross and he says to his mother, Behold Thy Son, look what they've done to your son and that I thought was Mrs. Till mm. saying to mm -hmm. the world look wouldn't what allow they him to did. close the casket yes yeah. look, look what, what they done. did to my son 
And so there are a lot of uh, mm. things going on in there. You have to look very carefully. It's at the National Museum of African American yeah, History and Culture at the Smithsonian. And then I had to get that cathartically out of my system. I said, I can't just paint that kind of thing all of my life. So there was the period when I said, uh, I'm going to turn to nature. Mm -hmm. Nature will become my God. And I started painting trees. Pine trees. Pine trees. They are so wonderful. And your dealer is wondering, why is David painting pine trees? The, right why are you painting? I said, well, because the pines don't talk back. <laughs> they don't um, fight back. And they have this sense of spirituality. If you can relate to them, they're forever green. And they surround your, your home in They Falmouth. surround my home in Falmouth, Maine. And I've tried to paint them every way you could think of. Looking up, looking down, looking across, looking, mm -hmm. you, you name it. And they have given me a sense of relief mm -hmm. in that um, I'm relating to something that I feel close to on another level, on a spiritual level. It also does something else artistically. It allows you as an artist to take an, an object that is stable and doesn't give you a great deal of information. Because most people would see a pine tree and not think of it as something beautiful. But David would take it and use it as a vehicle. It allows you to really reveal the talent. So when you're painting something that has, uh, it doesn't have a lot of information, it allows you to bring that creativity to bear and to bring it into that. So David's been painting these pine trees, but they're more than pine trees. The pine tree is merely the vehicle. Mm -hmm. that, yes. Is that accurate? That's, that's accurate. And I, you know, I go outside of my studio. We had a little two-room um, cabin in Maine when we bought the place in 1961. And, and Thelma um, said you had her washing clothes outside with a brick and on a, a string. <laughs> that's what she said. Yeah. She's not here. I'm going to dispute that. <laughs> <laughs> Had an old washing machine. Um, and um, uh, the, the first thing, you know, you would have thought that we're going to enlarge this little two-room. Um, it was originally a garage. Mm -hmm. But in 1967, I said, no, we've got to build a studio. Yeah. We built a studio in 1967 and later built the house. Yeah. Studio but first. Studio first things first. And um, this that, is actually inside the house with uh, mm. Rodney. We're going over some uh, work and signing some documents. I think for mm -hmm. some publications. Yeah. So um, Maine has been an important place for me in that regard. I can see nature. I garden there. I was mm -hmm. just saying that uh, I'm still country. I grew up in Appalachia. I still plant a garden, grow my turnips and collards, and uh, grow most of my food in the mm -hmm. summer. And my, some of that wine you brew downstairs? Well, we. That's from the leftover from the peaches yeah, and yeah. things. You don't throw it out. And Rodney, you know. whenever I come, Rodney says, Curly, don't eat, don't eat that. Don't yeah. drink it. Watch it. Don't drink it because Well, David. he's busy going to Whole Food, paying whole check, and there it is right there in the garden. <laughs> <laughs> no chemicals, no nothing. You know. Whole um, check at Whole Food. Whole paycheck. <laughs> uh, and I, I, have, um, I have peach trees, pear trees, and many people say, Peach, peach trees grow in Maine. And we, we say down south, yes, peaches will grow in Maine. Mm -hmm. And um, I picked two bushes of peaches this fall. And my dear wife, Thelma, still cans and preserves. I do a little canning and preserving. Mm -hmm. I picked two bushes of pears. And we, we kind of live on the land when we're there. Mm -hmm. Go down to the brook, catch trout. And... Um, have a good time. Yeah. Is that why Rodney's at Whole Foods? <laughs> <laughs> but it, uh, to your right slide is a show that we organized for David in um, Tokyo, Japan. Go back one. Osaka, Japan. And while we were there, we did a graduate school arranged for a conference around David's exhibition. That's on your left. I mean, I'm sorry, right here. Go back right there. 
So the students did papers on this exhibition, on his work. While we were there, the dealer came in and said she had a client that was interested in talking to David. And he was a very successful businessman and a, a real a serious client of the gallery owner. And uh, when they met to talk, the client, who is a manufacturer of uh, chocolate candies, was interested in David's images being on his next year's chocolate. So, and he distributed the chocolate between all kind of department stores, uh, Thailand, all over Asia. So there was, for that year, the chocolates that you got at those stores like Lawson had a David Driscoll image on the chocolate. Now, I facilitated that, but I have a little problem with this. I bone to pick. I facilitated this opportunity. And far as I know, only Rodney and David received royalties off this chocolate. <laughs> We got back, not a peep from him, not a word. <laughs> Silent, you know. I'm waiting for that royalty from the chocolate. We, we decided that I would get the royalties from the brown chocolate. He'd get the royalties they from the white chocolate. chocolate. <laughs> not only that. <clears throat> they had did it one time before, and it was Basquiat they had <laughs> on the chocolate. So David and Basquiat. So we also had, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the encounter in Athens, Greece, where we were doing the presentation. This is a shot of a dinner hosted by David's two students uh, on a balcony overlooking the Acropolis. It's to the left, so you can see the entire scene at night in Athens is beautiful. And they're fixing the best lamb. If you want to have good lamb, go to Greece to have lamb. And it was an amazing story because the two students had attended Howard University, and we're saying, how did these two Greek women get to Howard University? The first one explained that uh, she was researching colleges and university and saw that Howard had the colors of the Greek flag, blue and white, and discovered that they taught Greek at Howard. She said, this is where I'm going. She gets to Howard, discovers they don't teach Greek. They have Greek systems. In <laughs> Greek letter organizations. Yeah, Greek letter organizations. She said, I did teach them Greek, though. <laughs> so she was right. And then the second one comes to campus, and they're just so delighted. Her, her fellow students, black females, ran all over campus to get her. So there's another woman from Greece coming in here. And she was sent to Greece because her, her father had passed, and her uncle who was responsible for had a... Uh, law office in, uh, in Washington, D.C. as well. But they love their David Driscoll. And during the conversation, uh, the one who's become a very prominent uh, children book illustrator, the other was the wife of the ambassador to... Uh, the Minister of Finance. Minister of Finance. During the Papandrea. So she goes they and went brings broke out a, that era, yeah. a, a, a small <laughs> sketchbook. And in the sketchbook is a drawing she did that included David and other students at the March on Washington. Mm -hmm. August 28th, 1963. They were right there with him, these two Greek students. So it was amazing. So David has been transformative. And here he is, a sh uh, next shot is him working in the studio with me. As I mentioned, we published over 50 editions of David's work. As well, he talked me into coming to the Driscoll Center. I was on the board and before I knew it. I was the uh, visiting director. Then I become the intern director. And now I'm there. It's been seven years. And still printing David's work. <laughs> and the final shot I want to show with you is the recent exhibition that David had at D.C. Moore, which had almost 400 people in attendance at his opening. But the, and most of them were his friends and people that cared about him. Of course, people that wanted to see the art, but people who had a deep affection for him. Like we do at the Driscoll Center, and now that I hope you do. Thank you so much.
Well, I had, as uh, Professor Holton said, I had grown up uh, in the atmosphere of art patronage, art history, et cetera, et cetera, at Howard University with Professor James Porter, Professor James V. Heron, uh, Professor Alan Locke, and others who really were the progenitors of the African American art movement. And I, my first course with Professor Porter was a course called Negro Art, in which he used his text, Modern Negro Art, published in 1943, as the textbook. And I was young and enterprising, and I almost committed that book to memory. And he was such a great teacher. He dressed well, he spoke well, um, and I, I said, I want to be like that man. He was not only a scholar, but he was a painter. And so over the years, I kept in mind that the role models that I had seen at Howard University should be what I wanted to do when I uh, moved out in the larger art world. And so in 1955, when I graduated from Howard, I had the audacity with a bachelor's degree to ride around to the HBCU saying, I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm ready to teach. I've had the best of education. And um, my teachers helped me compose letters. And I wrote a letter. I sent letters around. I don't think I sent to any of the, um, uh, I don't think I sent to uh, Prairie View A&M uh, in Texas, but um, I sent one letter, as I recall, to Talladega College, Talladega, Florida. There is no such place. But in those days, you know, the postman would either read your letters or direct it in the right direction. So he marked off Florida and said, try Alabama. It went to the president at, Al at Talladega College at that time, Dr. Arthur D. Gray. And he responded by saying, regrettably, we have no opening, but our teacher, uh, Claude Clark, uh, is considering going to graduate school. And if he leaves, we'll send you a letter. And sure enough, Mr. Clark, major painter, you know, he left and went to graduate school out in California, in Oakland. And I got a letter about a month later from Dr. Gray saying, your letter has been on file, but we'd like to invite you to apply for this position. And uh, with that comes all of these questions. Um, can you teach art history? Yes. <laughs> can uh, married two daughters, two little girls? Can you teach printmaking? Yes, I studied with James L. Wells. Can you teach ceramics? Yes, hadn't had a ceramics course. <laughs> so the list went on. But I must have impressed them with the notion that I had some competency in those areas. And you know, in those days, you know, thank God for HBCUs. I, you had to almost be a master of everything. You couldn't be just an ordinary person teaching at HBCU. You had to teach more than one thing. So when I arrived at the University of Maryland, teaching painting, art history, drawing, and things like that, they looked at me like I was an animal from outer space. And they said, what? why would you teach all these things? Well, to me, it was knowledge. And I could pass it on. So. Make a long story short, when I arrived at Fisk and was given a chance to do two centuries, I thought I was ready to bring to the American public, not just to the African American public, but to the American public, as I told Mrs. Golden, the notion that 
these artists had been overlooked over the years, and now's the time to include them in the compendium. Proof of that was a decade later, I was asked to do Hidden Heritage, and uh, Dr. John Albrands was director of the Bellevue Art Museum out in, outside of Seattle in Washington. And he invited me to come and lecture on a major exhibition of African American abstraction that April Kingsley had done. And I said, I'll do it if you let me go to the roots of all of that. Abstraction isn't new. <clears throat> so he said, come and lecture, and I went out. And of course, I started with Joshua Johnson in the uh, early 1800s and came all the way up. And he said, I have a PhD in American art history. He said, I've never heard of these artists. And he said, it's good or better than all of those I studied. He said, I feel cheated. And he said, let's see if we can't broaden it. And that's how Hidden Heritage got started. Let's add on to two centuries. So I say all of that to say, the two centuries had been spewing and boiling up in my blood for a long time. And um, I had good mentors. James Porter, Lois Jones, Elizabeth Catlett, Charles White, Romare Bidden, Jacob Lawrence, you name it, who said to me, now is the time. And they were the ones who were so supportive. We did filming of them, went to their studios, and to a great extent, the American public in general saw for the very first time that there was a large body of materials in the visual world out there that they didn't know about. And this brought about a change in the whole notion of what the definition of American art should be about. Dr. Driscoll, I'm Delphia. Oh, Delphi, you're here. Oh, my goodness. Um, I'm back in Houston, and mm -hmm. I'm just wondering how we take the greatness in you and pass it to the next generation. I am really concerned that the, gen that the next generation and generations beyond your platform around art, you have such a story to inspire them. So how do we do this more globally? Um, mm -hmm. I understand the tour, and that's wonderful. But what's the, there has to be some, your story is so great on so many levels. The art is the platform. But I have to say for myself, being a native Houstonian, Avia Wallar can attest to this, we never got exposed to this until I went to work for the National Museum of African American History and Culture. And the greatness is beyond the art. It's all you went through. It's your whole story. How do we pass that? What, do, what medium do we use? Because we can get it funded. I'm a fundraiser. To get that story out to a broader, broader African-American up and coming. Well, I don't have the answer to that. But that's, a, that's a major question. But I will say this. The beginning is that the beginning is with the youngest audience that we have. We have to emphasize the importance of the arts in our schools instead of cutting back, instead of erasing. We have to be dedicated to the notion that, as I said, art is a commitment to good living. It's part and parcel of the de definition of how you live the good life. To me, art is that spiritual connection to something that we can't explain. We know it links us to something bigger than we are. And so we have to teach that to our young people so that they will understand that there's something other than entertainment in art, that there is production, there are the rewards for being productive. And I think that starts 
in our schools, in our churches, in our community centers. And we can't wait until they go to college. Sometimes it's too late. When they go to college, there's the emphasis on finance and the money. Uh, why you want to be an artist? You're not going to make any money. And I recall as a kid in Appalachia, growing up in the cotton fields, in the corn fields, and an uncle of mine said to my dad, who was not a trained theologian, but had a good sense of reality about the world, he said, that boy's smart. If he were mine, I'd make a doctor out of him. And my dad said, don't worry, he's going to be somebody. And they never, never questioned my wanting to be an artist. So I think we have to imbue that kind of interest and commitment from the family core. Now, you know, you can go wrong on it because every, I've seen it uh, every going out to places and everybody every child is a is a master and they, my my child did this can you look at this no let's get beyond that <laughs> every child is not a master because art is a priestly calling everybody can't do it otherwise we'd be doing it why do you admire artists because they do something very special that you like. It's hard to explain it, but that's where my spirituality, my religiosity, and all of those things come in to say it's a higher calling. And when you recognize it in a child, be it dance, music, be it theater, encourage them early on. Don't discourage them. And we've got to get back to the notion in our school systems that art is just as important as, as STEM. Yes, yes. We've got to get there. Can we have one more question? Fear and doubt are basic human characteristics, but you have to take the leap of faith to believe that there's something bigger than fear. There's always got to be belief beyond disbelief. There's got to be relief when you can't see the way. And I think you have to understand, you don't have to be a religious person or anything like that to achieve this. You have to have a common understanding that there is something in the world bigger and greater than you that you need to accept and pass on to somebody else. And regardless of what the situation is, Try harder, try harder. Um, when I come back to Houston, uh, when I'm 100, uh, <laughs> uh, I'll tell you some of those wonderful stories that Aaron Douglas told me, that Langston Hughes told me, that Elizabeth Catley told me people like that, that became star traits and characteristics of my hopefully living the good life. Thank you. Before we leave for, um, go upstairs for the reception, I'd like to ask 
David Driscoll to come forward, and I'd like to ask Araneta Pierce and Gaynell Drexler and Mary Olzane to join me at the podium for this presentation. As they come forward, I, I just have to say, this was extraordinary. This was so magical. And so very, very meaningful. You connected us in person with our past, with our culture, and you propel us forward um, with such passion and such determination. So I asked these ladies to join you here because this all came about as a result of the fact that in June 2018, we had a fundraiser called For the Sake of Art to, um, to help support the University Museum and its programs. And David Driscoll was one of our honorees along with Radcliffe Bailey. However, Professor Driscoll had to go to Switzerland at that time to receive a very special award. So our chairs, Mary Ozan, Gaynell Drexler, and Evelyn Washington presented the award um, to Radcliffe. And the remarks that you heard from Araneta was a synopsis of the beautiful remarks that she gave that evening at the event. So we wanted to bring you back, David, to give you this very special Sankofa bird, which has so much meaning. And the figure, as you know, reflects the idea, the concept in African mythology of the bird looking back to retrieve our culture so that we move forward. And it was designed especially for you by our ceramics professor, Jesse Sefuentes, who would be here, but he's giving a ceramics exam. Oh. <laughs> but this is just um, a token from us for all that you have done. Thank you. Thank you so much.